Mm. Pray with me. Father, we take inventory right now of all that we can comprehend of you, all that you are. Uh, We repent of the ways that we have forgotten you in this past week, the ways that the cares of this world have pulled us from you, the ways that we have then suffered a lack of hope and peace and joy in you. We turn now back to you. We sit under your word. We worship you. We adore you. And we ask that we would do our best to get out of your way as you work in our hearts and mold us and renew our minds. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Hey, good morning. My name is Glenn, if I haven't met you. One of the pastors here. Really excited for this morning. We are beginning a new sermon series. So if you brought your Bible, I want you to meet me in the book of Exodus. Exodus. (laughs) Uh, We got two people excited. Okay. Exodus is the second book in your Bible. That word, by the way, Exodus, it's derived from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word exodos, which means uh, a going out or a departure. The story of the Exodus is the story of God, Yahweh, rescuing and delivering his people from the oppression and the cruel slavery of the tyrant Pharaoh in the, at the time, world superpower of Egypt. Um, Traditionally, Moses, who will emerge as the main character in this book, is known as the author. Uh, The first five books of your Bible, also known as the Pentateuch or the Torah, Uh, Exodus is the second one. Moses is thought to have uh, either done the actual writing or uh, influenced the writing of all five of those books. When Jesus himself quoted from Exodus, he attributed it to Moses. I don't know who you trust. I trust Jesus. So uh, this is an amazing story. I personally, I don't know that there is a story that I uh, adore more than the story of the Exodus. I was talking to Roy about it this week. Um, It is so epic in scope that I I can't think of another story outside of what Jesus Christ did in his death and resurrection that that gives you uh, more compelling ups and downs of of emotions and twists and turns. And uh, you can just get obsessed with the, the, the grandness and the awe and the power of God on display in this story. The drama of this story has captured people for millennia. Uh, Many filmmakers have expressed through their art, you know, their rendering of the story of the Exodus. And although definitely not fully accurate, um, the best rendering, without a doubt, is DreamWorks 1998 classic, The Prince of Egypt. If you know, you know. If you have one of those lying around, you you get it. You know what's up. Uh, By the way, students in the room, that right there is a tape uh, for a video home system, a.k.a. VHS. You had to have another machine called a VCR to play it. It has actual film in it on little wheels, and you have to rewind it to rewatch it. Those were good times, amen? Those were good times. The liberation that is the the key theme of this book has inspired anti-slavery movements across our globe. And the cry of, let my people go, it sticks with you and stays in your heart from the moment you first read it, from the moment maybe you first hear it depicted. We can't wait to explore the themes of this book because without them, you and I will not fully comprehend and understand and appreciate the fullness of what Jesus Christ has actually accomplished for us. This story in Exodus, um, it really foreshadows 
a lot of things that are going to be true in a greater way about what Jesus does. In fact, uh, we were just in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 24, verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Exodus is a book about God. It is a book about Jesus. It's a book about our liberation from the slavery of sin. It's about our need for or a deliverer, our need for salvation. It's about our need for God's presence and God's leadership. It's a book about our, our faith and our trust in God's power over darkness and evil. It's a book about our trust in God's plan and his provision, even in the darkest times. Exodus is a book, most importantly, don't miss this, that informs our understanding of the thing that you and I need the most in our life every day. And that is an increasing understanding of who God is. Exodus is about God's character. In fact, in the world of theology, which is the fancy word for the study of God, we discover what are called incommunicable attributes. Um, This is things that God exhibits that we don't. Um, There are communicable attributes, which we experience by being made in God's image, and there are ways that we reflect Him and ways that we can grow to be more like Him and ways that we are connected to Him. Um, Incommunicable attributes are the things that make God, God. They're the things that about him, like his, how, how he's all-powerful, how he is all-knowing, how he is unchanging. They're the things about God that we can try to define, but not really in our finite terms. And they are the cause for us to revere and worship God. And I've, I've titled this morning's message, God Will Work It Out. God Will Work It Out. Um, because that is something that is so true to the character of our Lord, is he will work it out. Um, There has never been a Christian that has lived and breathed life on this earth, man, woman, or child, whom God has not worked all things out for. There's never been a person who has placed their faith in God, and he has not worked everything out for them in the end. Ever. Not one. We have much to explore in the months to come, but for now, let me just set the stage in Exodus chapter 1. I'll start with a little known fact. Um, In the original Hebrew language for Exodus chapter 1, which we don't see translated perfectly in our English translations, the book of Exodus begins with one word, and. And so what that immediately keys us into is that this is a continuation of a story that has already been being written. Now, to spare you, a long, whatever you call it, prologue, whatever, to, of the book of Genesis. Let me just give it to you very simply. Um, in the book of Genesis, we learn about the creation of the world, but, but in the book of Genesis, a character is introduced named Abraham. Maybe you recognize that name. And God chooses Abraham to be the man, the father of the nation of Israel. God's going to create a people group on earth who are directly related to him. They will be the people of God, and through them, as God blesses them, they will eventually bless the entire world. Um, We know on this side of it that that blessing of the entire world ultimately comes through Jesus. Um, But two promises that God made to Abraham, he promised him that he would, his offspring would multiply, and that he would form a great nation. He also promised him land. And the, the book of Genesis is filled with a lot of ways that um, Abraham and his son Isaac and his son Jacob do a really good job of trying to make God not keep his promises. And um, God is always intervening, always protecting, always keeping true his end of the promise. And when you get to the book of Exodus, here's what the first verse says. These are the names, first section, of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. 
All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Keep that in mind. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. So Joseph was part of a family that obviously had crucial, I mean, they were a, a, a part of a crucial, a crucial part, excuse me, of God's plan. And so what happens is uh, he, he ends up being sold into slavery against his will by his jealous brothers. And Joseph, who's the final story told, the final character in the book of Genesis, gets shipped to Egypt. Thus, the move of the whole storyline to Egypt. But there's one small thing. Some 400 years have passed. And so there is a new character that enters into the story. And before we get to that, it's really amazing that um, 70 entered Egypt because by the time the Israelites exit from Egypt... Speculations are all over the place, but somewhere between 600,000 to a million people during their time in Egypt, they, they grew. So far, so good. God holding to his plan. But I want you to pick it up with me in verse 8, because here's where we have, um, what do you call it, the inciting incident when you're talking about stories? Now, there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, God's people, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, and they made their lives bitter with hard service, in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. I want to stop right there. The ancient Egyptians were um, somewhat infamous for their sense of superiority and and, and racial and ethnic superiority toward all other people and people groups. And so it isn't surprising to see them um, afraid, as is mentioned in the text, and and discriminating against a a minority group in their midst. Um, some, Some research would say that they were afraid of the Hittites, on the, the north side of Egypt invading and what, ha- what would happen if the Hebrews decided to have a slave's revolt and, and take over. Um, this is a Pharaoh, too, that feels no debt to Joseph. Um, what happened in Joseph's story was all God, but Joseph started as a slave in Egypt and he eventually worked his way up to being like second in command in Egypt. And with God's help, he interpreted some dreams that Pharaoh had that revealed there's a famine coming to the land. And so this Pharaoh, 400 years ago, entrusted a ton of leadership to Joseph, and all these surrounding nations came to Egypt because Egypt, for seven years, stored up all their food, and they were ready for the famine to come. And nobody else knew about it. And lo and behold, Joseph's family, who had sold him into slavery, eventually came and had to be reconciled with their brother because they were in need. Um, this Pharaoh now that takes over, that is ancient history. There's no sense of, oh, wow, your um, father's father, your people, whatever, are the reason that we are here and the reason that we have the strength that we do. Um, There's no long-term indebtedness there. It is meaningless to him. It's meaningless to this Pharaoh's greed. It's meaningless to his desire for power. And so you read in the text, They afflict them, strong language, afflict them with heavy burdens. Um, They ruthlessly made them work. It says ruthlessly twice. uh, Made their lives bitter. So I I don't want us to escape from just the humanity of this. I know I say that a lot, but just try to like imagine being a Hebrew, being an Israelite in this time. Your whole life is miserable. You are under a regime 
where you probably receive some rations. You and your whole family are nothing more than tools and instruments to be used for big building projects. You are giving your every day to building up an empire that hates you, is threatened by you, and you are physically pained and grieved all the time. And here's the thing. If being treated like cattle wasn't enough, they could not have anticipated the horror of Pharaoh's next decision. If you uh, first see it in verse 15, the next verse, if you meet me there, then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Puah, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall, she shall live. And then we see it taken to its fullest measure all the way down in verse 22, the last verse of our chapter. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile. But you shall let every daughter live. Injustice. That word. Injustice. Do you feel the pain of that? In even these first verses. The horror and the tragedy of something like this. I want you to just stop and think of this evil. Um, one commentator really stunned me when he reminded me as I was reading that this was not a time when they had ultrasounds. So a pregnant woman for nine months is anticipating the birth and when she gives birth and it's declared it's a boy. Can you even begin to relate to the unimaginable horror of knowing that child's fate? Um, This is dark dark, 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 treating babies like waste. And it's a notion that tragically has not changed in our modern day, and it should burden our hearts with grief. It should lead us to action, church. Um, You can't read this account and not think about human history and the fact that from generation to generation, what happens here in these pages in Egypt is reminiscent of So many things that humanity has been responsible for. So many injustices that have filled uh, our history. Tragic atrocities and evil right now that's even happening across the globe. Um, People being trafficked or unable to defend themselves. And it can even be too easy to point out there and, and, and about things that have happened, you know, over there when some of you in this room have been on the, the bad side of injustice. You have been exploited. You have been abused um, against your will, and there's no recourse. Um, Dynamics of power were used against you. And whether you have felt deeply the pain of injustice in your life, or you've observed it in the world around you with a broken heart, I want to press in on three quick things. The first thing is this. Don't get it twisted. God is a God of justice, and he stands with the oppressed. Always. Always has. God is a God of justice who stands with the oppressed. Just wait for the rest of the story of Exodus. Just wait for us to march through this account Psalm 103.6 says the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Psalm 146, 7 through 9, who, God who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. Second, God expects his people to partner with him in seeking justice and loving mercy. We see it in scriptures like Deuteronomy 10, 18, and 19. He executes justice 
for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, and he references the Exodus, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Isaiah 1.17, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. In fact, right here in this first chapter, I want you to consider the verses that we skipped, starting in verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. Okay, whatever you need to say. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Two women women stand firm against injustice, and they give us a model for something that I think we all need to grow in. It is the thing that made them seek justice. It's the thing that made them choose to go against what their government did. Demanded. It's the thing that made them defy an empire. It's the thing that would end up saving the life of the very child whom God would use to train and raise up and empower to be the instrument of deliverance for his people who were crying for justice. There are people like these women standing firm who God uses to turn the tide. And what was true of them? They feared God. They feared God. God. You see, in our lives, which it's hard to even compare to theirs, but circumstances and people can seem really big and God can seem very small. That is the natural inclination of our human heart. That is where if we do not do anything to stem that tide, we drift. People, situations, words spoken to us, things that we have to endure are massive God is tiny. This is not what it is to fear God. When God is giant and everything else is small, our courage and our security and our boldness and our contentment and our trust in him immensely grows. From Shifra and Pua's decision, because they feared God, comes Moses, comes David, comes Mary, comes Jesus, comes our hope for life eternal, our hope of peace with God. That we get to be his children, reunited with him, blessed forever. These women would have never known. They would have never known what would come from their standing up for what was right. They just did the next right thing as they lived their life before God. They feared him. They were in awe of him. May we learn from this church. Church, may we fear and be in awe of God, the lover of our souls, as we represent him on this earth. And number three, third, for the guilty, whose blood and death is on their hands, and the unrepentant throughout human history who call good evil and evil good, for the oppressor who never humbles himself or herself before God, justice is coming. Justice is coming. Um, Jesus is coming again, and God will work it out. As David Mathis puts it, on that day, every cry for justice will be answered far more fully and finally than we are able to answer pleas for justice in this age. We will put our hands over our mouths as the risen, omnipotent lamb exacts perfect justice in his perfect precision without excess And without compromise. And as the 24 elders in the heavens declare in Revelation, he will destroy the destroyers of the earth. He will repay the wicked. And as scripture tells us, he will settle every dispute. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. How many seemingly irreconcilable conflicts in this age, which our judges and our judicial system stumble over again and again, await the day when the judge finally comes and sets all right, and we will marvel at justice. 
It is good news in a world of evil like ours that justice, full and final, perfect and complete, is coming. His name is Jesus. And oh, how sweet to be hidden in him. If you've not yet bowed your knee to Jesus and asked for forgiveness and mercy, this, this is a justice and a wrath that you will experience because you are still in your sins. But praise God, he sent his one and only son out of love for you and for me to pay our sin debt by atoning for it on the cross. Praise God that he sent his son to be a perfect, blameless, sinless one who would act as a sacrifice for us. Praise God he made a way for us to be washed clean that he would look at us and he would see perfect righteousness credited to us from Jesus himself because Jesus took our sin on himself. What an amazing exchange. We can be covered by him. We can be clothed in his righteousness. Our sin can be forgiven. We've all been party to injustice, big or small. We have. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God but we can be pardoned by him. And all it demands, for anyone in this room, you've delayed, you've delayed, you've delayed. All it demands is faith in Jesus and trust in him. It's a, it's a surrender to him as the forgiver of your sin. It's a turning of your life to be transferring ownership of it from you to him. He loves you. He is extending his hand of grace to you. We will literally have a prayer team up here before this gathering is over and you will be invited to actually stop delaying and give your life to Jesus. You've been looking for love in all the wrong places. You've been bowing down and worshiping and trusting everyone and everything but the only one who can give you what you're looking for. The one who's gonna come and bring justice to everything is gonna come and be a benevolent, generous, loving king forever. And you have the chance to be a part of that kingdom simply because you trust in what he has already done for you, not what you still have to do to perform for him. So how should I end a message like this? It's a chapter with some principles, sure. It's really a a narrative that just kind of is setting us up on the course of Exodus. And I want to go back to where I began. Exodus teaches us who God is. And from a chapter where he isn't even mentioned, God's not even mentioned, we already see his sovereignty. Um, that God is sovereign means that he has his hands in everything. He is in complete control. He exists outside of time. Um, he holds all things together. He has a plan that no one and nothing can thwart. And here's the thing. We all know this and have experienced it personally because God often exercises his sovereignty in unexpected ways and through unexpected means. I never thought my life would bring praise to Jesus through cancer. I never thought I would make much of Jesus through sickness and weakness. I never thought, I would have never had the thought that I could preach the hope of Jesus from a position of meekness and forced submissiveness and pain as much as from a position of strength and leadership and influence and personality. And yet here I am understanding more deeply the sovereignty of God and realizing that he is the only one, not only worthy of my reverence, my fear, and my worship, but also of my trust. He is good, and he only does good. And I want to remind you, if you're a Christian, child of God, you are called in Scripture an overcomer. And it is by the blood of the Lamb and also the word of your testimony. The same God who can orchestrate the incubation of 70 people into a nation where it was as difficult as slavery and genocide to result in a group of 600,000 to a million marching through a parted sea 
to become a new nation set apart for him is the same God of the little tiny details of your life and mine. He is sovereign. In Romans 8, 28, you've heard it before. You need to hear it again. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Here's the thing. None of us were born into this world with the notion that our life would look exactly the way that it has up to this point. None of us come in willing to admit that we're naive and all the things that the American dream feeds us that we think are going to happen in our life when those things don't happen. We're surprised by that. We, we never plan for suffering and trial. We never plan to be in a place where we feel injustice. We never plan to be in a place where our hearts are broken, where we're devastated. We never ever plan to be our children. For those of you who are parents and grandchildren, we know not what awaits them in their life. They will experience life in a fallen world where nothing is as it should be. As much as we try so hard to pretend that that's not true, it's true. And right there with them is a God who hears. Right there with them is a God who knows, a God who sees. And let me just tell you this. The degree to which any one of us learn to surrender our lives to his will, the degree to which any one of us is willing to actually increase in our trust of his plan, the degree to which we are willing to humble ourselves before him and say, your ways are not my ways, your thoughts are higher than my thoughts, is the degree to which we will have peace. Period. When we get our minds and our hearts fixed on the simple truth that God will work it out, as simple as that sounds, life is so much easier to endure. May a supreme comfort in our lives be that he is God and we are not. And we can trust him for reassurance. All you have to do is stare in awe at the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus that purchased for us the happiest ending that we could ever dream of and a friend who sticks closer than a brother to hold us and keep us through it all. There is no one like our God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, you will work it out. You will work it out. Where that does not land on our hearts this morning, I pray you would remove distraction, you would remove all the doubts and the concerns and the whatabouts, and you would get us to a place of humility that says you will work it out because you're good and you love us and you work all things together for our good. God, I'm asking for a spirit of faith to increase in our church, a spirit of hope to increase in our church. As we look at the people of Israel in captivity in Egypt, and we know you're coming to bring justice. You're coming to bring deliverance. You're coming to bring freedom. And in the same way, Jesus, you came and you brought for us freedom from sin, freedom from death itself, freedom from all of the schemes of the evil one. You liberate us. You lift our burdens. And we know you're going to keep your promises. Hallelujah. Praise be to your name, Jesus. And all God's people said.